continuing the story of the two-dimensional divergence theorem, uh, we've got to the point of, of defining the flux of a vector field through a curve. And I just pointed out that one clever way to look at it is you do the ordinary line integral of a new vector field, the rotated version of f, and more explicitly, you take pi plus qj and you rotate it, and that makes it into minus qi plus pj. Do that, do the ordinary line integral of that guy, it's going to be minus qdx plus pdy. That's going to be the flux. That's not the only way to think about it. That's kind of the way the book does it, because um, that allows them to use Green's theorem to prove everything you want to know about the divergence theorem. I don't think that's, if that's all, the, all you know about the divergence theorem, I don't think that's sufficient, because it's so beautiful on its own. Okay, so let's think of it as, instead of just uh, the same integral but on a new vector field, let's really think about it in its own terms for a second. I've got this notion, the flux of a vector field through a curve and across a curve, and I'd like to know if similar ideas to Green's theorem apply to it. And because it looks so similar, and because it's just sort of a rotated version of, of the integral, it should. Um, but there's other ways to think about it, and, and the answer is absolutely yes. There's something called the divergence theorem. Which is the analog of Green's theorem, and we're going to prove that in, in two ways. Um, first, I'm going to show you a proof that's very similar to the proof for Green's theorem, but will really help when we get to three dimensions and the three-dimensional divergence theorem. And then I'm going to show you how it really just follows from Green's theorem if you've, if you've taken the, the effort to prove that as well. Okay, so um, let's look again at this story where I've got a curve let's say that's the orientation of the curve going along the curve, but now what I really am thinking of is it's going outward, and it's a closed curve. That's very important. And not only that, it's the boundary of a region that doesn't have any holes in it, where the vector field is very nice on the whole region. And let's have a vector field that's kind of more often than not, but maybe not always, kind of flowing outward. So it looks like there's kind of more outward flow than inward here. So it looks to me like the flux of this vector field F across this curve C, let me be fancy with my colors here, I guess that deserves to come from the curve, dot, oops, sorry, I almost wrote the wrong thing, dot N, ds, that's the flux, looks like it should be greater than zero there, just to be fixed ideas. Now, um, let's think about the proof of Green's theorem that we had, which was to take this, take the region inside and split it up into a bunch of pieces, and so we're going to take this region, split it up into a bunch of little pieces, little rectangles. And what I can do is I can look just at one of these regions, and I can look at the flux out of that region. I can look at the blue vectors going, well, there's some going in there, some going out here, and I can look at the, uh, the flux out of each and every one of the little regions. And the, the key idea of Green's theorem is absolutely still present here is that suppose I look at that region and the one next to it. And if I look at the flux out of this region and the one next to it, let me blow that, that part of the picture up. So these are really supposed to be small rectangles, but I'm going to blow it up. Certainly, it still works for big rectangles. And I'm going to be looking at the flux out of this guy. So I'm going to be looking how much is going out of that region, and then I'm going to be adding it to how much is going out of this region. Well, hey, look at this those contributions are, again, going to exactly cancel out. We saw that in our, our alternate proof of Green's theorem, the one different from the book. Um, and that's going to happen if you have something over here. That's going to cancel right here. Yeah, that's going to cancel. That's going to cancel. All of the internal boundary stuff is going to cancel in pairs. And that's going to cancel across the whole thing. And so once again, just like in our proof of Green's theorem, 
the total flux is that the only things that don't cancel are the things on the actual boundary of your whole region. And so the total flux is going to be the sum of the fluxes out of all the small rectangles. And the story is very similar. We can maybe we can uh, try this a little bit on the, on the applet um, when we're uh, back in class. It's that if you make the rectangle small and you just calculate the flux out of each small rectangle, as the size of the rectangles goes to zero, those fluxes are going to go to zero. That's not interesting. But if you look at the area of the rectangle and you take the flux per unit area and you multiply and divide by that, the flux per unit area, that turns out to be a really interesting number as these rectangles get smaller and smaller and smaller. That is going to go to an interesting number, not zero. And then, of course, in the limit, as the rectangles get small, that's going to turn it, the sum turns into an integral. The area of the small rectangles turns into dA, and we get flux, whatever that number is, which is the limiting case of flux per unit area. So it would be really nice if there is a, a good um, formula for that. Well, there is. And so let's look at, um, let me do something that's sort of this analogous to what you were doing, uh, but the simple case of what you were doing on one of the previous homeworks. Got a little bit too involved there, probably. Let's suppose we just look at vector field F is PI plus QJ. And Q, P and Q are linear functions. This doesn't prove it, but it turns out to give the basic idea, and it really does work for the whole thing. So once again, we can look at this rectangle that we're trying to take the flux of this guy F out of, and we section it up into four regions. And on each region, we want the flux, the outward flux of that thing. And so the flux is the integral over 1 plus the integral over 2 plus the integral over 3 plus the integral over 4. And um, I don't think it's going to fit into the 10 minutes, but I think this is actually going to be a good intro to what we can do in class, that when you calculate this explicitly, it turns out, and I'll, I'll skip this right now, it turns out that it's going to be proportional to A plus M. That it's this, it's the X comp, it's the X, the, the number in front of the X for P and the number in front of Y for Q. Well, does that give us a guess as to a partial derivative formula, well, that's looking, if we, and certainly if we believe there's any analogy to Green's theorem, it's looking like maybe the partial of P with respect to X plus the partial of Q with respect to Y. And I think um, what I'll do is I'll either finish the story myself in class or have you guys work on this if we have time in class to see that we really do get this quantity coming out. And it turns out that that is what's called the two-dimensional divergence of a vector field in the plane. And it really is just a, a measure of flux per unit area out of a tiny little box. And therefore, what this, um, what this adds up to, I'll go ahead and, and give away the punchline, the theorem is that the flux, in other words, the integral across the curve of f dot n ds, is the double integral of dp dx plus dq dy dA. That's a y. And that is called the divergence of f. It's written div f. And there's another notation for it, which we'll learn in a minute, or in a, in a few days. But 
that's a good place to be um, coming into Monday.